The unique engineering design of the human body reaches its apex in the hand. Powerful and precise servant of the mind, creator of civilization and culture. 25 joints give it 58 distinctly different motions and make it the most versatile instrument on earth. Hands that build a home, a heart, cities, a nation. Lesson number nine this morning is the hands. <clears throat> hands. Truly a marvel of divine engineering. This is the Lord's doing. I don't know if you pay much attention to your hands or if you've given them much thought lately, but they're certainly remarkable. If you believe in God, you understand by looking at them how wonderful a creator he is. If you don't believe in God, you should look at your hands because, you know, maybe that will change things. Sir Isaac Newton, he once said, in the absence of any other proof, the human thumb alone would convince me of God's existence. You just look at your hands. Uh, we have an opposable thumb. That's what this is called. It's not just a thumb. What it, it's, it's opposable. We can touch our fingers with our thumb. That's what that is. Being provided with one on each hand uh, enables you and I to do work for the Lord and serve God in a myriad of ways that his other creatures simply cannot. We can't. Because we have hands instead of hooves, we can do what animals can't. Because we have hands instead of paws, we're able to do much more for the Lord and for our fellow man than any other creature can. In fact, hands are emblematic of the work that we do. Oftentimes, work is represented with hands. Okay? The first time that we read the word in Scripture, New Testament anyway, in the Greek, kair, I think is how you pronounce it. It's the word hand. It's found 179 times in the New Testament alone. But the first time that we find it is in Matthew chapter 3, verse 12, where it speaks of the work that Jesus came to do. The first time we see the word hand is in Matthew 3, 12, in reference to the work that Jesus came to do. It says, his winnowing fork is in his hand. And he will clear his threshing floor, gather his wheat into the barn, and burn the chaff with fire. Hard work. That's what Christ came to do. Christ came to do hard work. And they're typified by the winnowing fork in his hand. In the figurative sense, it is by definition, the hand, the instrument a person uses to accomplish their purpose. And Jesus is going to use his hands to get his work done. In that context, Matthew chapter 3, speaking more of his hands doing the work than the threshing fork, the winnowing fork, Jesus came to work. When Christ came in the likeness of men, he came here to work, to labor, to serve. I believe that it's true. His hands were calloused long before they were ever pierced. He worked all of his life, not just at the end, he used hand tools to work. He used hand tools to build. He was a carpenter. He went into ministry. He broke bread with his hands. He mixed mud with his hands. He prayed with his hands. Jesus held children with his hands, healed sick with his hands often, always using his hands to bless God, to bless others. He used his hands and he worked. Jesus wasn't afraid to sweat. He came not to be served, but in his own words, he came to serve. The word serve there is interesting. It means literally kicking up dust. What that suggests is that a person who serves with the fervor that Jesus did so hustles to meet the needs of everybody else that they leave a proverbial cloud of dust behind them. What do you need? What do you need? Can I help? What can I do for you? And this was Jesus' M.O. from the beginning of his ministry to the end. The guy was hustling. He was getting stuff done. He worked with his hands. He worked. He worked. Used his hands to bless. Used his hands to give. Used his hands to serve. Worked hard with his hands. And he always did that. You know that. From the beginning of his end to the min end of his ministry, he always worked with his hands until, of course, they were bound by those he came to serve and then nailed down on beams with 10-inch spikes, that rendered his hands for the first time in his life to be 
inoperable. His work before God was done, but not his work in this world. Still a lot of work to do. His work before God was finished. He said it himself. Symbolized, both figuratively and literally, by the nailing of them to a wooden beam so that he couldn't use them anymore to mix mud or pray or bless. But his work in the world was just beginning. And without hands of his own being that they were inoperative, he used the Apostle John's hands from that point forward instead. And the Apostle Peter's. And Andrew and Philip and anybody else who was with him. And then he used Tertullian's hands. And then he used Augustine's hands. And then he used Wycliffe's hands. And then Luther's. And then Bunyan's. And then Edward's. And then Wilberforce's hands. And then Hudson Taylor's hands. And on and on and on And the work of Christ continues to this very day, being accomplished now through your hands and mine. Or at least it's meant to work that way. The work of Christ continues with our hands, doing things to serve and to bless with our hands. The Bible explains to us that we were originally created to work. That's what we were designed by God to do, was to work. In Genesis chapter 2, it says that God placed the man he had made in the Garden of Eden to tend it. The Hebrew word for tend is abad. It means to work, serve. God put Adam in the garden that he had made so that Adam could work in it. And his work was service to the God that gave him that opportunity. Adam, by design, was made and given the opportunity for work and service. We all know, however, that tragedy struck when sin entered, right, the human narrative. So sin comes in and totally distorts everything. Sin touched and affected the nature of work and service as much as it touched everything else. If you don't think that work wasn't affected by the fall, go to work tomorrow, right? I mean, you just lost one precious hour of sleep tonight. It's going to catch up with you in the next 24 hours. I can guarantee you this. You'll be slugging coffee just to stay awake, depending on what kind of a job you got. Work, it's not as enjoyable as you would have thought it would have been had God given it to us as a gift. What kind of gift is this? This Work is not a gift, okay? And that's why we need to be retaught what the Bible says. It is a gift, That's been as touched by sin as any other gift that you'd ever get. Good grief, you buy toys for my kids and they break, okay? Uh, You you buy me a car, it's going to rust. You could give me the best gift in the world and it's temporary. So all great gifts have been touched by sin. Work is one of them, one of many. So because of it, we don't always use our hands to serve God and work for the good of others as we were originally meant to do. Do we? Do we? Do your, do your, are your hands reserved exclusively for the service of Christ and the work of the kingdom? I mean, because mine aren't, unfortunately. Sin becomes a great adversary, an obstacle to using my hands exclusively for that which they were designed. That's not news to anybody, is it? I'm not, you know, like, okay. The first thing we did with our hands in a fallen world, if you go back and look at the Genesis account, the first thing that we did with our hands in a fallen world was to sew a blanket out of leaves to hide us from God. That was work. They went through the trouble of finding the right leaves, the right size, you know, they had to get fitted for a new... And then they're sewing them together. It doesn't give us the details, but they did work no longer to serve God, but to hide themselves from him. And the second thing that we did with our hands was to pick up a brick and kill our brother.
Pretty clear from the beginning here that once sin enters the picture, work becomes something different, and we no longer use our hands for the intended reason that we were given hands to use. We hide ourselves from God behind our, hand, behind our work, the work that our hand does. We separate ourselves from God, and we harm those around us. We kill our brother. So sin didn't change God's reason for giving us hands. It just changed what we did with them. Okay? We don't use our hands anymore to bless and serve the Lord exclusively now, and thanks to sin, now most of our work is done to bless and serve ourself. In most cases, God's lucky if he gets served at all. He didn't get any of our service until perhaps recently or a year or two ago or, or maybe further than that when we became born again and he intervened and he said, listen, I designed you for something different than what you're doing. Would you like to serve me? Would you like to be of use? Would you like to work for my kingdom? Some of us, we said yes. Others, still dragging our feet. God's lucky if he gets anybody's service at all. Let me ask you this. What do you think it would take to wake us up and make us realize that we are the hands of Christ? We're his hands. His work gets done in this world through us or it doesn't get done. So if we don't offer ourselves to God's service, the death and destruction that surrounds us, it's partially our fault, isn't it? If we won't serve others, if we won't work for the Lord and expand his kingdom and do the things he's commanded to, then how much of what we complain about is actually, in some sense, our fault? We could make this world better. Christians collectively can do great things in a dark world. They can shine like light. They can preserve what is rotting. We are called by God to serve him. But that means then that we have to actually work. We got to do what he said to do. That might mean sweating physically. That might mean bleeding. Yeah, physically, that might mean crying physically. Yet those who go forth with tears... We'll come back with rejoicing. Yes, work is hard. And work for the Lord is really extra difficult because I don't get any particular, immediate, sort of selfish blessing from it that I want. Really, I'm doing it to bless somebody else. I'm doing it to bless God. And that's a real challenge to our flesh to, to work for someone else's benefit. No immediate paycheck. No incentive. No bennies. And yet that's what God has called us to. Listen to this. During World War II, there was a church in Strasbourg, Germany, that was totally destroyed. But there was a beloved statue of Christ that stood by the altar at that church, which actually survived the bombing. Only the hands of the statue, I saw a picture of it, there's Jesus like this, and the hands of the statue were missing because they were sheared off by falling debris. The rest of the statue was intact, but there's Jesus, no hands. When the church was rebuilt, a famous sculptor offered to make the new hands. But after considering the matter, the members decided to let it stand as it was. No hands. The reason? Christ has no hands but ours to do his work on earth, they said. If we don't feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, help the stranger, visit the imprisoned, if we don't clothe the naked, who will? Christ is depending on us to do the work that he did while he was here. We are his hands. We are emblematic of the work he does. And let me say this. <clears throat> Jesus has no less zeal and passion to serve people now than he did back then. He is as gung-ho to heal and feed and educate and clothe and be of good service, to kick up dust, hustling around to see who needs his help next. Just as much now as he was then, only 
he has um, involved us. And you've got to wonder whether his hands are as cooperative now as they were then. Back then, he was in full control of his hands. He could make his hands do whatever he needed them to do, up to and including being nailed to wood. But his hands, you and I, today aren't always as cooperative. Therefore, the work of Christ suffers. The question this morning isn't, do you have a job? The question instead this morning is, does the job you have accomplish God's goals? Does the work you do fulfill God's desires or yours? That's the big question. Because if we're surrendered to the Lord, then everything we do belongs to Him. You go to work tomorrow, not for the paycheck primarily, but for God's glory primarily, and that will revolutionize your work ethic. I can promise you that. It worked for me. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 says, Whatever you do, work as if God was your boss. You can look at the verse yourself. I paraphrased a bit, but we're being told to work as if God was our employer because ultimately he is. And by the way, hands, hands are work-issued tools that are given to us by our employer to serve his purposes. These aren't for me to use. I'm on the job, and these are his tools issued by him for his goals to be met, not mine. I serve God with my hands. Self-serving, that's the opposite, right? We either serve God with our hands or we serve ourselves. Self-serving is a detriment to all of life and all of society. Just so we're clear on that, a detriment. Because first, it's void of love, right? Self-serving means I'm not serving others. I'm not serving God. It's me first. Self-serving is void of love. 1 Corinthians 13.5 says love is not self-serving. And I, listen, if I put the pieces together, I go, okay, if, if self-serving isn't love, if there's no love in it, then what is it? If it isn't love, okay? And if we look at Scripture and start pulling the pieces together where you realize how devilish it is to be self-serving, if there's no love in the work that we do, Salvation becomes virtually impossible, and here's why. If we're self-centered in everything that we do, then there's no love in it because love is not self-centered. And if we remove love from the equation, we've removed God from the equation. Because John tells us that God is love. And if God isn't in my work, and if God isn't in my service, it doesn't matter if I do it in a building with a steeple or anywhere else on this planet. If I removed God from my work and my service, then it's salvation. It does no one any good at all. That's why Paul took this approach in life. He says, I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage. Why? So that they may be saved. These are his words in 1 Corinthians 10, 33. Paul's going, I changed my game and I serve other people in everything. I don't really take myself into account like I used to. Now it's all about everybody else and I try to please who I can because I want them to be saved. He also said in that same chapter, no one should seek his own good. No one should do that. No one should seek his own good, but the good of others. The good of others. This morning we're being called to look at the work that we do with our hands in question. Are we using them to worship and serve God by giving and blessing to others? That's why we were given hands. What would happen if God ever said, listen, if you're not going to use them for the reason I gave them, then I'm taking them back. You've heard of other countries where like if you're caught stealing, you know, it's a crime and they actually cut the hand off what if god was like that you're stealing glory from me you're stealing time you're stealing everything that you do with your hands is meant for you and you alone he says i'll take them back but he doesn't do that he allows us to repent of our sin and begin 
Use it because I'll tell you why. He lets you keep your hands. Because if we serve him, our life becomes so full and so rich with the blessing of God. And that is the very reason he gave you hands in the first place. Wasn't just so that he should be served. God says, I'm not served with human hands. I don't need it. I'll ta- if I want it, I'll take it. I own the planet. I own the cattle on it. I own the hills that the cattle are on. Thousands upon thousands. Everything that is there is mine. I don't, I'm not served by human hands. Why did I give you hands then? So that you could serve me. But I didn't think you needed to be served. Nope, but I allow it. Why? So that you can be blessed. So listen, blessing isn't found in serving ourselves. It never is. That's the catch. You think it would work, but it never does. I'm going to work and I'm going to earn my first million by the time I'm six. Uh, yeah, well, even if you did, you would find out that it's not, it's not the way it's meant to be. Right? Our hands are inventions. Somebody invented them. These are genius. And yet we misuse them. When we take them and utilize them to bless ourselves only, nothing good comes of that when we misuse the intended use of any invention. Right? Like toasters are really bad bathtub toys. Okay? It will hurt you. You misuse the wrong thing in the wrong way. You get the wrong outcome, and hands are one such invention. Second uh, <laughs> Timothy chapter 3, verse 2 says, Terrible times will come when people love themselves. Terrible times. And it's not just talking about like your life will be terrible if, you're, if you live self-centered. And uh, he's saying it will create a terrible generation. The whole generation will be ruined when it's marked by selfishness. It will ensue widespread damage. Uh, so not only is it really foolish to misuse an invention, but it's also a belittlement to the patent holder. And God is the inventor of hands. It's, it's to belittle God. It's insulting to him when we show such disregard for his intentions. He gave us our hands for a reason, and when we disregard that, God is not pleased. In fact, you know that the Holy Spirit's job is to point the finger at Jesus, to glorify Jesus, and to just like, he's Jesus' MC. Make Jesus look good. Point to Jesus. And here's what the Holy Spirit said through Paul to me and you. Philippians 2.21. Everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus. Imagine the Holy Spirit going, nobody cares about Jesus. Nobody's serving him. Nobody's working for him. They're all doing it for themselves. It's the Holy Spirit screaming through Paul going, Jesus isn't getting his. Everybody's out working a job so they can have more money, so that they can do more fun stuff, and they can just, and it doesn't work. And God is not blessed, and Jesus is not flattered. Not in the wildest of our dreams could we ever imagine that he's blessed when we work our fingers to the bone so we can have a better life than the one that he gave us. I need a raise, Lord. I got to work harder. I got to work overtime. I got to get a better job. I got to go back to school. I got to do this. Why? Because I want a better retirement because I want this and I want this and I want this and I want and I want and I want. And he's going, aren't you content with the house you live in and the car that you drive and the job that you got? Like, why are you so driven by the discontent that puts you on the, the hamster wheel of life that the rest of American culture is on. I've called you out of that wheel, out of the cage, to serve me like the creature I made you to be. And we work ourselves literally to death trying to get ahead of where God placed us. Look at your hands this morning. Go ahead. You can. You can oftentimes see the work that a person does in life by looking at their hands. Okay? You look at your hands. These are meant for work. Um, imagine the difference between the hands of a concert pianist and a coal miner. You suppose there would be a visual difference there? Yeah. You can oftentimes see the difference uh, in the work that's done by simply looking at their hands. It's the same thing with that the hands of those who serve God look much different than those who serve themselves. 
What I mean by that is sin in Scripture has long been symbolized as blood on the hands. Now, how often we read about you've got blood on your hands, God says you've got blood on your hands, because what we do with our hands reveals who we are in our heart. If we're selfish in our heart, it'll come out in our works like blood on our hands. We're guilty. We aren't generous. We aren't using our hands to help others. We aren't using our hands to serve the Lord. So I ask you, as you look at your hands, are they clean this morning? You say, well, I can't see any blood. They must be okay. Well, all right then. It's all hypothetical, isn't it? But I do think that we ought to take a look at our life this morning and see whether we're operating with clean hands. We know now more than ever that clean hands are, <laughs> like, you know, really important. You know, you look at the CDC's website, they have it on there, quote, Keeping our hands clean is one of the most important steps we can take to avoiding getting ourselves or others sick, end quote. Just keeping your hands clean. And I think that, oh, what's true in the world of the CDC is so true in the house of God. We underestimate how important it is that we keep our hands clean, that we use them for pure and holy reasons, and how much sickness and death we could avoid in our own life and the lives of others, if we would sanctify our hands, cleanse them, and use them for the Lord's purposes. Did you know that a half a million kids under the age of five, half a million kids under the age of five could have been kept alive last year with hand soap? Clean hands. Did you know that British Columbia has their own CDC? According to their website, 80% of common infections are spread by hands. Spread by hands. Do you know how much less sin we would commit if we did get our hands cut off? Does that ring a bell? Didn't Jesus say something about that? He knew that with our hands we could do great good or great evil. Before germs were understood, hand washing was a rather trivial practice. We weren't always as obsessed with hand sanitizer and soap as we are now. You know, like you even go back to 2019, I don't think we were as obsessed with hand soap and sanitizer as we are now. But uh, in the early 1800s and beyond, it was trivial. That all changed in 1847 when a doctor. Uh, Inaz Samuel Weiss discovered that the high mortality rate among birthing mothers at his clinic might be related to the fact that his colleagues would come and deliver babies in the ward after having just left off dissecting corpses at the morgue without first washing their hands. He started requiring that they wash their hands going from the morgue to the ward. Once he mandated the groundbreaking new practice, <laughs> the mortality rate dropped significantly and hand-washing caught on. This Dr. Samuelweiss is known as the father of hand-washing, if you Google that. He's also known as the savior of mothers. And I think it's interesting because Selfishness kills people spiritually just as, just as much as dirty hands do physically. And God's been trying for so long through Scripture to get us to cleanse ourselves of that selfishness and filth. And Jesus did say that if your right hand makes you sin, cut it off. It would be better to go into heaven with one hand than into hell with both his brother James wrote about it too. He gave a bit more of a practical solution. Rather than telling us to cut our hands off, James just says, wash your hands, you sinners. <laughs> that's, that's funny. <laughs> Jesus is like, if your hand makes you sin, cut it off. And James is like, eh, or just wash them. Just wash them, you sinners. Right? Better solution. I'm going with James on this one, right? How do we wash our hands? 
We wash our hands by living a pure life. The Apostle Paul wrote this, don't use your hands for sin. Use your hands for good, hard work. There. It's just, it's simple. Ephesians 4, 28. He wrote to the Thessalonian church for Thessalonians 4, 11. He says, live quietly, mind your own business, and work with your hands. Work. Good, hard, honest work. 1 Timothy 6, 8. He says, be rich in good works. In Titus 3, 8, Paul says, those who believe in God should devote themselves to good deeds. We use our hands to work. We use our hands to do good things, service to the Lord, blessing to others, generosity, hard work. Are your hands pure this morning in the sight of God? That's the question. Have you washed them like James told us to? And furthermore, do you even know how? Here's the big hang-up. This is where the average person is going to make a colossal mistake by believing that their hands are clean when they're actually not. A lot of people this morning are going to say, yeah, my hands are clean, Based on what? Well, I, I do nice things for people. I do good work. I serve at my church. And they're going to assume that their hands are clean because to them and everybody else, they look clean. But to really answer the question of whether or not they are, we need a spiritual black light. You know what a black light is, right? You've been to raves and stuff, house parties and... and <laughs> Uh, I was in college in a land far, far away in a time long, long ago. And uh, I was in a hygiene class of some sort, some medical thing. And all I remember from that class really was that um, my teacher's name was Dr. Vasquez. I remember that. And then I also remember something he had us too. He's like, we're going to do a lesson on washing our hands today. And I'm like, Okay, <laughs> so he goes around to each one of us where we were sitting, and he puts a bunch of soap on our hands, and he says, okay, wash your hands, and he's going to teach us some important thing on how to wash our hands. It's like, uh, I paid how many thousands of dollars for this? So we're all washing our hands, and he says, now to properly wash your hands, you got to scrub in the cuticles, and you know, you got to do all this, and, and then uh, he's teaching us step by step how to do this. And then when you rinse, you got to do it like this. And so we rinse. And then he says, now I'm going to have you wash your hands again, and I'm not going to give you any directions, okay? Like, scrub the cuticles, rinse. And then we dry our hands, and we're all sitting there waiting for the next step. And what are we going to do now? And he says, um, what I just did was the first soap wasn't soap. It was actually dye. The second step was soap, and you were to wash your hands and see how well you followed directions. We're all going to find out now how well you followed directions. And he came around with a black light. He shined it over everybody's hands, and we're like, yeah, I mean, just glowing. Everybody's glowing. I mean, some of us, we got it up here in our hair, and, you know, he's like, how, what happened, you know? It was just a phenomenal, a colossal failure on everyone's behalf. Point well taken. I mean, that's the only thing about the class that I remember, side of the guy's name, probably because I gave him a bad Google review. You know, no, we didn't have Google back then. We had uh, horses and buggies. Um, but anyway, uh, we can look at our hands and believe that they're clean. Why? Because we washed them. I go to church. I do my devotions. I read extra this morning. It's Sunday. Why are we thinking that our hands are clean when they're not? Because we've washed them, or so we think. We come to church. We do all these things. But that's pure religion. And guys, if you want to follow the analogy, religion is like the dye. Some of us, that's all we got. We put on this dye, we've rubbed it in, we've scrubbed under the cuticles, we're working it into every crack and crevice of our skin, thinking that it's doing its job when really it's getting worse the longer we scrub. You cannot sanitize dirty hands with religion alone. Jeremiah 2.22, God says, although you wash yourself with soap and use an abundance of cleansing powder, the stain of your guilt is still before me. 
In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 15, he says, When you lift up your hands in prayer, I won't look. Though you offer many prayers, I won't listen because your hands are still covered with blood. God's using a black light this morning. God is that black light, and he can see what we cannot. And some of us, we may be doing all of the things that we do in the Christian arena, in, in the church environment and all, not really in faith of any kind. We're doing these things out of pure religious motivation. That's the die. And it doesn't come off easily. Some of us, we grew up in religion, right? You know, stand up, sit down, mm, 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 holy, you know, blah, blah, and we do all this, and we don't drink, we don't smoke, we're pretty good people, and so we got this thing instilled in us that we're good enough to get to heaven because we're good. And God's going, you're wicked, you're so evil, you have to undo. Part of the wickedness is proven in the fact that you don't think you are. You've got to undo that thinking that religion has left you with, that stain on your hands, and scrub all of that out. You need to be scoured. And we think, well, no, my hands are clean. No, the professor might say otherwise when you're put under the black light this morning. And so much of what we do, we may find, in the end, to have been worthless even though we thought we were working for God. We thought we were serving God. We did so many good things through the church and so much charity work, and we'd done so much good for so many people, and God won't recognize it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it says that a lot of that is going to just burn away. If it isn't done in faith to Christ, he won't count it. It don't matter to him how many people you helped. Who said you helped anybody anyway? Help comes from God. Get over ourselves. We're not doing any great thing. We're either on board with him, following his instructions, using his tools appropriately, or we're doing our own thing. And he will only reward those things that are done for him in his way, according to the patent. Romans chapter 14, verse 23 says, whatever is not of faith is sin. If it's not done in faith, then it's sin. You may have heard of the old saint, C.T. Studd. He wrote a poem once, and the refrain of that poem is, Only one life will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ will last. There is only one cleaning solvent on the market, one available to you and I that can wash the blood off our hands that can deal with the guilt of sin and the guilt of religion that can deal with the guilt of great immorality and cleanse us of self-righteousness and personal goodness there's only one it's not religion religion can do it it's not some sort of inborn goodness good nature no it's not affiliation, okay? Inheriting the right racial designation, getting suckered into the right political party, belonging to the right Christian denomination. The only thing that can get the blood off our hands this morning and out of our clothes, get this, the only thing that can get the blood off of you is blood. Blood. We know this to be true if we've been part of the church for any length of time. It's the blood of Christ. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. The blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses us from sin. Like, what a funny book this is, isn't it? Like, it has stuff in here about blood cleans you. Get washed in blood. Good grief, that just sounds creepy. But we have to understand that that's the only cleaning agent that we've got available to us that can do the trick. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14 says, The blood of Christ purifies our consciences from works of death so that we can serve God with our hands, with our lives, 
It's the blood of Christ that purifies us from the work we were doing that ended in death so that with our hands we can serve the true and living God. The work of our hands is never meant to be kept to ourselves. We are not meant to serve ourselves. The work of our hands is always to be rendered back to God. We see that example set for us in Matthew chapter 2 when the wise men came to Jesus. What did they come with? They came with hard-earned gold. That didn't come for free. Gold comes through hard work, and they presented their hard work of gold, frankincense, and myrrh to Jesus Christ. We're to do the same thing. Only fools come to Jesus empty-handed. Well, I spent it all on myself. This is just all for me. Oh, no. Those who are truly wise bring what they have earned with their work and lay it at the feet of Christ. So who decides this morning what you do with your hands? Like, who's, who's calling the shots? Do you work for God's goals or do you work for your own? Do you fulfill His desires or is your life about fulfilling your own desires? Whose dreams do you chase, by the way? Does the work of your hands this morning please the Lord or is it really, if we're honest, building a fig leaf thin barrier between us and Him? Are we sowing for ourselves a tapestry of hard work to hide behind on Judgment Day when he says, I never knew you. Yeah, but I did this and this and this. I did this and this and this, and I served and I worked and I did this. Oh, you can't hide behind that. Does the work you do in life bring health to those around you? Does it serve them? Does it bring new life? Or are you killing them with self-centeredness? And like Cain, you're left standing there holding the brick. What do you use your hands for this morning? In Lamentations chapter 3, verse 41, it says, let's examine our ways. Turn back to the Lord. And lift our hearts and hands to God in heaven. Let's examine our ways this morning. We're American. Right? We work hard. That's what we do. We're entrepreneurial. We start stuff. We finish stuff. And then we go on to new stuff. And we build and we... Let's examine ourselves this morning. Why are you doing it? For your own glory? For your own future? for your own little kingdom where you can be king or queen and rule and reign? Let's examine ourselves this morning, turn back to the Lord, and lift up our hearts and hands to God in heaven. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands. You know what he means by that? You know what it means to lift up your hands? Surrender. This is, this is a posture of surrender. We surrender our lives to God, and that includes our work, because work is part of life, not all of life, but part of life. And if your life is surrendered to God, then your work is surrendered to God, and you're welcome to put your hands in the air. But if your life isn't surrendered to God, you have no business doing this on the outside if the heart isn't yet surrendered. Are you surrendered? Where are your hands, and what do you put them to work in order to accomplish? That's the question. This is a marvel of engineering that you have at the end of either arm. We can do so much good with them, and we can do so much damage. Father, we acknowledge this morning that our hands are your hands, Jesus. That you are really um, not entirely at our mercy and yet dependent upon our cooperation with you. Now listen, if we don't serve you and, and we insist on being selfish, you will accomplish every last bit of work in this earth on your own. But what a shame for us having had the opportunity to invest in your kingdom and to cooperate with you in that work and having passed on it simply because we wanted to build things for ourselves. May it not be said of us, Lord, May we use our hands along with the rest of our body, not to mention our entire life and the years that we've got left. May we use them for your service. Employ us, Lord, for your use. Set us aside 
for your exclusive purposes, and may we be surrendered to that. Because, Lord, we know that you don't need us to serve you, but that if we do, we will be greatly blessed. And I think that we're all kind of chasing that blessing in life. It's what we want, Lord. Use our hands. Whether we do it on the outside or on the inside, we lift them to you in surrender. Take them and use them. They are at your disposal. They belong to you. They were lended to us. May we use them to invest in what really counts. May our work be effective and eternal. May we bless you with our hands.